This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. And it is an honor to announce that our program is part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend, give us a good rating and leave a review. All of that helps to get us discovered in all the different apps and all that good stuff. So the easiest way to find us is our main site, which is www.politicsandreligion.us. It's www.politicsandreligion.us. Or feel free to connect with me on all the social media apps at Corey S. Nathan. That's at C-O-R-E-Y, S is in Sam, N-A-T-H-A-N, at Corey S. Nathan. All of that helps get the word out so more people can participate in the conversation like the one we're having today with Stephen Forrester Hayes. Steve Hayes is CEO and editor of The Dispatch, one of my favorite media outlets. The Dispatch provides fact-based reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture informed by conservative principles. Prior to The Dispatch, Steve succeeded friend of the pod, Bill Crystal, as editor-in-chief of The Weekly Standard. Steve was also a senior writer for National Journal's Hotline and served as director of the Institute on Political Journalism at Georgetown University for six years. He's written for such publications as the LA Times, the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, National Review, and Reason. And he's been a commentator and appeared on such television shows as the Today Show, Meet the Press, CNN, Fox News Channel, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and today he's on TPNR. So <laughs> before we get, uh, thanks for coming in, by the way. How are you doing? Yeah, Steve? happy to be here. I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. Great, great to yeah. be here. Awesome, awesome. I'm so appreciative for you taking the time. But before we get into, we'll get into plenty of politics, but before we get into any of that stuff, unlike Jonah Goldberg, we have no ban on wide-ranging discussions of Spanish wine. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I'm happy to go wherever you lead me on that. <laughs> okay. Any recommendations? I mean, I might have splurged for a bottle of good Spanish red wine last night, actually. <laughs> um, more th There wasn't any special occasion, but there's a there's a Toro. It's a big, bold red called Pintia, P-I-N-T-I-A. And it's one of my favorites. It, when I lived in Madrid a few years ago, I think I could get it for 40 bucks-ish in, in Madrid, which was a splurge. But here in the U.S., you're you're paying close to 100 for it, so it was a real Man. it was a real treat. Um, okay. But it's my favorite, big big bold reds. That's what I like. You know, it's funny you say that because I, when folks ask me what my favorite type of wine, I just say obvious reds. <laughs> yeah, obvious so, reds. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So we we spent. I uh, one of my really good friends was a missionary in northern Spain in uh, uh, Pamplona region. So we. Um, spent a few different stints there with him several weeks and I fell in love. We sometimes we ventured out and I found a couple of uh, vineyards in uh, the Navarra region, I guess that's sure. that part of the country is called and just really fell in love. It's hard to find though. You really have to look. Anyway, we didn't come to talk about too much about that. So I was curious, it, it sounds like you started coming to conservative positions when you were still pretty young. Uh, so at what point did you begin to align that way and how, how did you begin to form some of those views? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know is is the short answer to that. Um, I've, I have always, as long as I can remember, had an interest in politics, and I did not come from a family that was particularly political. So we were not the sort of proverbial sit around the dinner table and talk politics family. We talked about, you know, our sports and school. And my dad was a, an adoption, is an adoption attorney, just recently retired. We talked about family stuff. We didn't talk about politics very much. And if I had to guess what my parents voted at the time, I would have said, you know, slightly right leaning, but pretty independent thinkers. I, I did not come out that way. I was, I was pretty conservative pretty early. You know, I think I had the tremendous advantage of growing up in the era of Ronald Reagan and our politics then for people who were 18, 
20, 25 years old, we're just so different from our politics today. Um, and I saw kind of the, the goodness of conservatism. So I, I was writing conservative columns for my campus newspaper. Um, I came out after I graduated from undergrad and moved to, to Washington, D.C., took a job at the Heritage Foundation, another institution that's changed tremendously over the past few years, and was it just couldn't get enough. I, I did some grad school in, in D.C. at night at Georgetown, and you know, D.C. is a really, um, or was, maybe it's not really anymore. D.C. used to be a really rich place for somebody on kind of an intellectual adventure. And so I, I just couldn't get enough. I would go to lectures at the American Enterprise Institute and then go to another lecture at night at the Heritage Foundation. And the next morning I'd go to Cato and, you know, go to university sponsored functions and read everything I could get my hands on. And it was a, it was a great place. So I'd say I, I, I was sort of instinctively conservative. Um, and then the more I read, the more I, I believed in broadly in limited government. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the Heritage writing. You edited that newsletter for the Heritage Foundation. That was your first job out of undergrad, right? It was. Right. And did you did you know you wanted to go into journalism or specifically political journalism as a kid? Or was that first job more happenstance because you were on this intellectual pursuit? Yeah, I mean, I think my my ideal. I loved writing um, in college and really in high school. I, I loved I've sort of loved writing in ideas. So I think my ideal was to to be a professional writer, but I, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do that. I mean, there weren't that many positions available. And you know, when I first moved to Washington and set up shop at the Heritage Foundation, I, I did a writing of a couple different varieties. I wrote. Um, this newsletter it was a quarterly newsletter, went to a couple hundred thousand Heritage Foundation members, but also did a lot of the writing, sort of ghost writing for Ed Fulner, who's the president of the Heritage Foundation at the time, wrote um, to uh, small dollar donors, helped draft some grant proposals, things like that. And I guess basically I thought if if I could write and do something in sort of the the world of of politics and ideas, that was the goal. Um yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, got, I grew up reading George Will. I used to read this thing called the Conservative Chronicle, which was a weekly sort of newspaper format publication delivered to my house, and it was a collection of all of the center right uh, syndicated columnists in the country. So, and I was, you know, I would, you know, literally wait at the at the mail slot for that to come. <laughs> Um, so I, I kind of couldn't get enough and, and I just bathed myself in, in all of those ideas from the beginning. Some kids are, you know, waiting at the mailbox for the release of the, the new tops baseball cards, but you, <laughs> yeah, I, liked, for... I was, I mean, I was a dork, I guess, in, in that respect. I, 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 I you know, I, I was an athlete in high school, I was an athlete in college. Um, and, and I was into baseball cards when I was younger. So I was, I was the guy who was at the the local drugstore picking up baseball cards in an earlier era. But I, yeah, the more I the more I read, the more I wanted to read. Oh man! So you were you were reading George Will. You were going to the seminars, and that was an interesting time too, ninety three, ninety four, because Gingrich's uh, con contract with America is that yeah, do I remember that right? Yeah. So I remember listening to some of his talks and reading uh, some essays that he wrote, Gingrich. Uh, at that time and thinking these are compelling ideas, but then some of the rhetoric, it's the first time I became aware that that the rhetoric was oppositional, was uh, uh, contentious. Yeah. And I didn't have as warm of a response to the contentiousness of the rhetoric. Did, were you were you discerning between those two things, the, the style and the substance, or were you just kind of rooting it on like, yeah, that's a good one? Yeah, I mean, not not. Um, certainly with the level of sophistication, it sounds like you brought to it. I liked the contract with America and what Newt Gingrich was trying to do. I thought there was sort of an, an element of common sense, limited government common sense to it. And I thought it was sort of brilliant in its mass appeal. Uh, the highly charged rhetoric, it didn't stand out to me. Um, and that may have been just my own ignorance about how sort of business was conducted in Washington um, in the years leading up to my arrival there. And to the extent that 
that I paid attention, it didn't bother me. It wouldn't have bothered me. I was sort of in it. You know, I was, I, I liked a, a pugilistic conservative style. I was sick of, you know, <laughs> decades of liberal governance in Washington, D.C. And I look, I do think, you know, it, it is the case. I mean, there's an element of the, the argument that some people in our in our modern era make about sort of the the tendency of a Republican establishment to just go along to get along and not make sort of ideas based arguments um, and sometimes to 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 line their own pockets. I bought that. I buy that critique today to a certain extent, and I bought that critique back then. So I was happy to have kind of an outsider making a more ideological argument. I was an ideological guy, and I didn't like the the sort of first seeking compromise uh, on everything that I thought some Republicans brought to the brought to their um, their conduct of the government's business. Yeah, it's interesting because I I realize that the common engaged citizen forms their opinion about conservatism more from the outspoken characters like a Newt Gingrich or obviously a Rush Limbaugh who is really beginning to emerge as a dominant player uh, in the media landscape at that time. But, you know, the Thomas Souls of the world aren't yeah. as widely read as uh, Limbaugh and, and then the, the whole industry that he's burned. Fox News was coming on the scene at that time. So our impressions are are more, I think, shaped by the media personalities than by the serious thinkers that seem to have formed your impression of conservatism and how you you arrived at certain views. Yeah, I I think that's right. I mean, that's certainly what you're describing is certainly the case today. Um, yeah. you, you know, in this era of performative politics, it, it is sort of the loudest voices that carry the day and, and don't even at this point make arguments. I think the thing that was brilliant about Thomas Sowell is whether you agreed or disagreed with sort of ultimately his conclusions or the cases that he made on whether you're talking about economics, or race, or housing, or poverty, what have you, is there was an argument there. And you could spend time in the argument and ultimately determine whether he brought the evidence and and, and made made a persuasive case to bring you along. So much of our politics today is just argument free. It's it's mm. sort of assertion after assertion after assertion. I mean, this is, I think, Donald Trump's, to, to, to the extent that we want to say he has a governing style, that's what Donald Trump does. He doesn't really stop and make arguments. I don't think he understands arguments. He doesn't care about arguments. He cares about power. So he just makes assertion after assertion after assertion. I, I mean, I took it all in at the time. I was a regular Rush Limbaugh listener. Um, I, I, I worked landscaping for three summers um, for Milwaukee County and spent most of my time cutting grass or doing sort of maintenance at, at a series of pools around the County. And, you know, I always had either a, you know, the old transistor radio or we, we got Walkman or the, Walkman. the thing to have. <laughs> and, you know, I was constantly listening to that stuff. I, I listened to, to Rush Limbaugh from noon to three more days than not, particularly in the summer. I'd say that, you know, when I was in college, I didn't do it as much, but I read all of that. And I, you know, I, I probably started with more media conservatives, talk radio types. I listened to Charlie Sykes from the Bulwark. I grew up in Milwaukee. Oh, Charlie was the king of, of Milwaukee. The time that I was sort of forming my, my politics, he was, he was incredible. And I would listen to him. My, my folks came to listen to Charlie a lot. So I took it all in. <laughs> I love you, what you're doing with the dispatch and your team is doing with the dispatch with Charlie, the the space that Charlie and, and, and Sarah are carving out with the bulwark. It, it gives me a sense of hope that independent media outlets are taking some space back. I heard you say in an interview before the official launch of the dispatch, uh, you were talking to Jonah actually on, um, on the, the, the remnant, I was going to say the ruminant, the remnant, <laughs> um, you said there are strong incentives in modern journalism to provide affirmation rather than information. And I had to check myself because I was listening to this interview recently. This was in, you know, the summer of 2019. So how prescient was that? So given some of the recent revelations through the Dominion Fox News case, it, it just it really was it struck me how clairvoyant that seemed to be. I'd love for you to expound on that here. But also, do you see things improving in, in media and journalism? Well, part of the reason that I would say something like that in the discussion with Jonah was based on my own experiences. I had just come out of serving for a couple of years as the editor in chief of the Weekly Standard, as you yeah. as you noted, 
um, taking over for Bill in January of 2017. And, you know, I was reluctant to take the job. I, had, I turned down the job uh, a number of times. And I was reluctant to take the job for a couple of reasons. One was the emergence of Donald Trump. Trump had just been elected. You know, we had at the Weekly Standard taken a pretty strong editorial position against Donald Trump. We didn't think he was good for American politics. We didn't think he was likely to be a good president. Um, certainly wanted him to be. But our experience in covering him suggested that he would be the disaster that I think he was in many respects. And it was a hard time to to be running a a right leaning magazine um, when you, in this era of extreme polarization where people do want their views just affirmed, it was pretty clear that we were going to be pushing back against those views. Now, there was a certain excitement to that. I mean, it was, there was it, it, it's there is a uh, there's a real freedom to be able to make whatever the heck arguments you want to make um, without regard to who you piss off. And we were, the Weekly Standard certainly was never a Republican partisan organization. I mean, at the launch in the, in the mid 1990s, they took on Bob Dole, the Republican Congress, pushed in a number of different directions. So there's a history there. The second reason I was reluctant to take the job uh, initially was the owners of the Weekly Standard also owned um, the Washington Examiner. And the business model that they employed at the Washington Examiner was sort of this volume scale based outrage journalism. So take something that you read in the New York Times, find the thing that will piss off conservatives, rewrite it in three paragraphs, slap a clickbaity headline on it and send it to Matt Drudge so that you can get a, a bunch of hits and, and, and monetize it. Now, I, I want to say that there are really good people doing really good work at the Washington Examiner as well, but that was primarily what they were doing, and I was worried that that's the direction they were pushing the Weekly Standard. They had been pushing the Weekly Standard. So I had conversations with uh, the owner and and uh, the, the suits that sort of ran our business side and said, that's not the journalism I want to do. I don't want to just be in the business to piss people off. I want to be in the business to find people, to, fi to find things out to push people to challenge our assumptions, to challenge their assumptions. And while they told me that they didn't have any intention of pushing us in the sort of clickbaity um, affirmation journalism path, it was very clear that that's what they wanted to do. And that was, you know, those tensions existed for the, the rest of the existence of the Weekly Standard. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a long way of saying, you know, it may have seemed like the, the things I was saying were, were new, but it was born of that experience for sure. And I think we've seen many media outlets across the ideological spectrum practice this kind of affirmation journalism. I think it's one of the main things that's wrong with cable news. You look, read, read headlines. This is not true just of political journalism either. Um, there's a, a certain desire to be bold and controversial and make people angry so that people click in, in all kinds of journalism. I, I'm, I play fantasy football. And the thing that has perplexed me as a fantasy football guy over the past half dozen years, the, the prevalence of headlines promising a bold take. I mean, that's literally the headline. You cl cl come in here for this bold take from so-and-so writer. I don't want a bold take. I want an accurate take. Like, give me some numbers, back it up, make a case. Like, tell me what, tell me how I should think about this stuff. I don't care about your bold take. Anybody can have a bold take. Usually the bolder the take, the like, less likely it is to be accurate. Yeah, there's been a lot of that, and it's been a it's been a quick slide down. Yeah, it seems to me that if AI can challenge any type of journalism, that's the journalism it'll challenge because you can write a catchy headline. I was looking; I think it might have been actually in your uh, in in the dispatch. I was reading someone summarize a number of the headlines coming out of Tucker Carlson, and they were all very very similar, shocking. You know, using certain yeah. words that tricked the algorithms. You've mentioned a couple times now the when Trump came on the scene and and uh, you're cautious uh, at first cautious and in opposition to much of what he represented. You um, there was a there was a moment for me when I grew up in Jersey, so I knew this this character yeah. way before he ever came on the political scene. I had friends of mine that I graduated high school with that worked on the Taj, building the Taj. Uh, they oh, yeah. were contractors laying the cement in the parking lots or putting in the plumbing. And they were getting that 30 cents on the dollar if that uh, type of uh, negotiation after the fact from Trump. So a lot of us in Jersey knew who this character was. 
right. uh, let alone ruining the, U- the first version of the USFL. But there was a moment in um, the twenty in twenty fifteen, prior to the twenty sixteen election, where I thought, "Oh man, this this guy's not going away." And it was when he uh, he said that thing about John McCain. He said, uh, "I like my heroes who aren't captured." So you were actually there. I'm so curious what that was like to be in that room. And did you, so I realized in the, uh, in the 2012 cycle, there was one leading candidate after another, you know, Herman Cain, he says, ah, shucky ducky. And he falls off a cliff in the polls, you know? Uh, But after that incident, he wasn't dropping in the polls the next day, the day after the week after. And I thought, oh man, this yeah. is this means trouble. This guy's not going away. What was it like being in that room? And you got to ask him a follow up question. So what was that? To describe that scene for me. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was certainly an interesting moment for me. I was in Ames, Iowa at Iowa State University. There's a very powerful Christian conservative named Bob Vanderplotz who runs an organization called Family Leader. And and they have a it's sort of a cattle call of, of presidential candidates in Iowa the six months before the Iowa caucuses at the beginning of the presidential year. And they sit on stage and they they do these interviews. In this case, it was with Frank Luntz, the Republican uh, pollster and and sort of language maven. And yeah, I was in the balcony for this uh, this question to Trump about McCain. And and he, you know, everybody's familiar with 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 what he said. So I like people who didn't get captured. And I was yeah, I, I'd gotten to know John McCain pretty well um, covering the the 2008 race. I was in New Hampshire with John McCain when his can- after his campaign had collapsed, pr- sort of preparing, spent, a, spent a, a good week plus with him, sort of preparing to write you know his political epitaph. And then it, it turned out it was the beginning of his his revival. But I was, you know, was the, there were four of us driving around in a van for a week. It was a great experience. I got to know him a, a little bit. A lot I didn't agree with with McCain on policy wise, but I thought he was a good man. And I, I was um, viscerally just angry to hear this from from Donald Trump. I, I knew I knew what John McCain did in Vietnam. I thought it was absolutely offensive that Trump would would say something like that, particularly given Trump's own history. So I, I went scampered down from the balcony. I mean, it was, and, and, and it was a noticeable thing in the, in the crowd. I mean, the audience gasped uh, when, when Trump said this, So I went from the balcony down to this area where they were doing these press conferences. And I asked him a question about it. And, you know, I think, I can't remember it, it, it ended up being about a 10 minute shouting back and forth between me and Trump. I can't remember what my first question was, but at some point, I asked him a direct question. I was reading from my notebook his exact words back to him. And all I said was, why would you say this? And I, I really had never experienced anything quite like this in my time as a reporter. He just said I didn't. He said, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about McCain's uh, p- poor work on veterans affairs issues. And so I read him his words. I said, no, 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 no. This is what you said. And this is all, you know, this is all being videoed. It was like, how could this guy possibly lie? Everybody saw what he said on stage. I'm reading him his exact words now. And he was just claiming, you know, it's like the kid with the Oreos on his face. Like he was just claiming that he hadn't eaten the Oreos. And I'm like, but you have Oreos all over your face. Like it was a crazy moment. And I certainly thought it would damage perhaps irretrievably his campaign. That was the... The headline that the that my editors at the Weekly Standard put on the piece that I wrote thought it would end his campaign. But what was interesting is I, I came to talk to uh, folks who were in his his orbit after that and who were at his side at the time, and they too thought it was the end of his campaign. Everybody who was working with him, um, sort of at least on his Iowa team at the time, started preparing their resumes to send to other candidates because you know not only was he saying this this thing that was untrue about a former Republican nominee, even if John McCain wasn't a, likely to be a favorite of Republican primary voters in Iowa, he was also picking this, this fight with a guy who was on Fox News a lot. Now, I don't claim to be a, you know, I wasn't a, a big deal at Fox at the time, but I was on Fox three, four days a week at the time. And, you know, they thought that was really bad form. But as as you say, um, you know, it not only didn't hurt him, I think in some respects, that incident and others that we would see over the subsequent um, year and a half, part of the reasons that he was popular because he was willing to take on anybody on anything. 
and sort of in in that aggressive in your face way that we came to know is kind of Donald Trump's signature style. Yeah, I've been trying to diagnose now for almost eight years why that's the case. What what is it in our culture? What is it in our political discourse that paved the way uh, for someone like this? Pa- you know, especially folks I go to church with. Um, we, we know the fruit of the spirit. We know, you know, good, good Christian virtues. And he is the exact opposite of that. And the only thing I could diagnose, the only, the only conclusion I could come to, they actually articulated in, their, in the 2020 campaign, he's fighting for us. That there was right. this uh, spirit that, that had built up over decades that folks felt like they weren't uh, seen, they weren't heard. That there was an um, an enemy, uh, a political adversary that needed to be fought against. So anything was on the table, any sort of anti-virtue, if you will, was okay if yeah. he's fighting for us. I think that's right. You know, I said earlier, p- part of you know when I was when I was um, yeah I wasn't I was running a, a journalism program at Georgetown at the time uh, and and going to grad school, so I wasn't actively involved in politics or journalism at the time of the the new Gingrich election but I said before to the to the extent that I was I I was pretty sympathetic to the argument that Republicans should fight a little bit here like throw a punch like get in an argument uh make a case and you know, certainly if, if that's how I felt in 1994 you fast forward to the Tea Party era and I was pretty sympathetic with what the Tea Party was trying to do. In my mind, that was, you know, a movement that was based on, I thought at the time, a desire to limit government and a concern about debt and deficits. And that's where I that's where I was in 1994. That's where I was in 2010. It's where I am today. I think in retrospect, a bigger part of the appeal of the Tea Party for many sort of Republican base voters was less about the the policy stuff that I cared so much about and much more about, oh, thank God somebody's fighting. They're taking it to Barack Obama. We're sick of this Obamacare. We don't like the spending, you know, the stimulus package. We're, we're, we're taking it to Barack Obama. And, you know, the, the moment where I think that was became sort of obvious and undeniable for, for me, and I don't know if you remember this, but was the stand with Rand moment on the Senate floor where Rand Paul had gotten into this back and forth with Attorney General Eric Holder about whether the U.S. government had the right to drone its own citizens. And I mean, the the theoretical that was bandied about at the time was whether uh, a U.S. citizen could be droned in a Starbucks. And, you know, I don't think anybody really thought that the U.S. government was going to drone one of its own citizens in a Starbucks. It just wasn't a, a big concern. But Rand Paul does this actual filibuster as opposed to the the sort of fake filibuster, goes to the Senate floor, speaks forever. And this was something that took place on on Twitter as a sort of a social media moment that probably wouldn't have been possible 15 years earlier. You start seeing hashtag stand with Rand and then Ted Cruz goes down to the Senate floor and then other Republicans follow down to the to the floor. And it becomes this huge thing. And I remember watching it unfold in real time and thinking like, are people really worried about ordering a caramel macchiato and you know having their head blasted? <laughs> and I don't think that was the case. I think it was just this was somebody frontally and aggressively taking on Barack Obama in a way that Republicans really hadn't done. And I think it 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 sort of catalyzed conservatives in a certain way. After that, you saw the the government shutdown in 2014. The the rant, stand with rant thing was 2013. And you saw conservatives take a much more aggressive kind of uh, consequences be damned attitude to fighting and fighting became sort of the coin of the realm. Yeah. And and certainly in McCain's, uh, one of his big decisions, obviously, was uh, picking Sarah Palin, you know, the uh, right. Uh, what, what was the comparison she made? What, what's the difference between a hockey mom and a, a bulldog lipstick? <laughs> you know, she, yeah, she yeah. Was certainly the, the fighter. I wasn't a big fan of Sarah Penn, partly for that same reason I was talking about Gingrich before, because I saw I, I didn't see the substance. I saw yeah. the, you know, the facade, if you will. Um, and I thought, man, she's talking about folks that are my friends, my family. That's not who they are, you know, and mm. stealing words, stealing great words like Patriot. All of a sudden, Patriot is only the domain of of the right. I just I, I didn't like that style of politics. I was much bigger fan of the Tip O'Neill, uh, Ronald Reagan days, 
you know, when they'd have robust debates. Uh, and then, you know, at six o'clock, they'd, they'd have they pour some scotch and and uh, be be pals. You know, it's it's so interesting to hear you say that. I mean, I, I'm where you are now. I, I'm not sure I was where you are now back then. I mean, I, I remember being uh, being pretty defensive about Sarah Palin. I had done a lot of reporting about her possible selection. I knew the people who were involved in those discussions. And I, 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 I liked what I thought she represented in a certain way. And I totally bought that um, she was treated with really regrettable condescension mm. right away, right away. You know, I think if I'm if I'm being honest about it, I look back on that. It turns out that some of that condescension probably was was uh, was unproductive, was counterproductive. Skepticism was was called for, and I probably had a blind spot on some of that because I, you know, so accustomed to. I mean, I I, I buy the argument that media certainly lean left and ha have not covered Republicans well over the years. I think there's a reason that all of Newt Gingrich and Donald Trump's um, complaints about the mainstream media resonate as much as they do. And it's not just whining. I think there's a substance there. I think it was a problem for years. And I thought she was the victim of some of that coverage. But in retrospect, I was probably more defensive of her than she deserved. I mean, I wouldn't have called myself a fan and I was critical in in, in many ways, but I, I, I did. I was sort of receptive to arguments that said she was being mistreated if you could looking back at your time say between when you arrived in dc 93 if you could take if you could have a political mulligan uh either for yourself or 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 the conservative movement between 93 and when you were fresh out of college and and 2015 everything leading up to the trump era uh would you have any if so what what would it be man that's a great question a political mulligan, something that didn't play well for politics. I mean, you know, I, I think I would probably point to honestly sort of anything and everything that that led to, to to this current moment, right? That that led to the election of of Donald Trump. So you know, pick your pick your factors there. I don't know on on a, on a political side if there's anything in particular that I would jump on into 2015 i think the government shutdown was regrettable in in 2014 um and while republicans didn't pay for it the way that i think many people thought they would pay for it politically at that time i think it cemented in people's minds that there was a nihilism to some of what republicans were doing i at the time i didn't um i didn't oppose them because i thought there was a utility in making clear that barack obama um, continued to own Obamacare. And I didn't think it was going well. And so while it was the case that the Republicans were never going to actually win that fight, Barack Obama was never going to repeal Obamacare. I thought there was a utility in making clear for voters, hey, this is this this is his. Republicans are are opposed to it. But I you know the the, the sort of shutdown and the the failure to have a, another a solution, a policy alternative. I think was a was a bad moment that continued to haunt Republicans, and that was also I would say I would say I mean, collectively the the, the things that ha have led to this this moment of performative politics where people don't really care, certainly many members of Congress, they just don't care that much about legislation that's passed and about governing. They care about you know having a, a blog. Um, praise them or or uh, doing a podcast on their own or going on Fox News and being praised by Fox News personalities. I think those are the things that have led us to, to a really bad uh, point in American politics right now. Man, you're depressing me, man. It, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are no Paul Ryans left in Congress. You know, our, our own congressman, Mike Garcia, this is a very, I'm in California 27, a very, very purple district. He only won by 333 votes in the 2020 cycle, right? Uh, which is less than one tenth of 1% of, of the 340,000 that, that voted that cycle. Um, but he, he doesn't seem to govern or, or uh, participate in legislation. You know, if you read his Twitter feed or you look at his Fox News hits uh, or his Newsmax hits, 
he seems to only be playing to the most uh, extreme fringe of his current party. And I, I find it regrettable. I wish we had a wonk. You know, I think that a, a real uh, political junkie could persuade some of the folks who are to to his left. And that's the district that we're in. So it is really regrettable. You know, but that, that ties into another question I had about the when you started the dispatch. Um, so take, take me back to, say, 2018, 2019. What did you see in the marketplace and the culture that um, that inspired you to launch this independent media outlet? Were there certain needs or gaps that you were seeing as as um, as opportunities to fill? Yeah, I think I think there were. I mean, in part, this was what we were trying to do with the Weekly Standard for uh, for its last couple of years. You know, if you if you looked at what was happening on the right or center right in conservative media, I think there people understood that politicians wanted to perform that the more they could sell outrage, the more hits they would get, the more money they could make conceivably. And I thought uh, at the Weekly Standard, basically just by being true to the the principles that guided the Weekly Standard from its founding, uh, we could kind of stand stand astride that and oppose it and sort of lean back into facts. So we hired a number of new reporters, people who had come from the Charlotte Observer, people who had come from sort of traditional journalistic backgrounds to help fortify our fact-based coverage. Um, and then, you know, we obviously we had very some of the best magazine writers, opinion writers, narrative long form writers in the entire country at the Weekly Standard. So we tried to do that at the Weekly Standard. And in my view, it was working. Uh, now, the owners will tell a different story. I'm not sure that their story is entirely accurate. Um, but numbers suggest that it, that it was working. And it was just this misalignment between their wanting to play the volume scale game. And, and you know, my view was you're much better off monetizing subscriptions and growing your subscriber base. That's more stable foundation for growth. Um, but it's hard. It doesn't maybe doesn't scale as well as they wanted to. So when I talked to Jonah Goldberg for the first time about doing this, this is what we talked about. We said, look, this is a, you know, there, there's certainly bright spots in places in the conservative media and they're individuals, maybe publications I can point to and say, these are people who are doing a great, great job. But it was definitely the case. I think it's still the case that what you've seen um, in terms of trends on the center right has been this drift toward anger and exaggeration, outrage, and in many cases, just outright fabrication. Um, you know, you've got popular media outlets that just publish bullshit. Like it's, it's false stuff. I mean, obviously we've seen this with what Fox News was doing. That's the, the, yeah. the most obvious and, and recent example. Um, but we thought that, <clears throat> that we could create a place where inquiry was actually sort of at the heart of the, the business reporting facts um, where people could come with different points of view and learn something, actually deepen their understanding of a topic. So we do, you know, probably half or more than half of what we do at the Weekly Standard is is one version or another of explanatory journalism, um, where we say, "Hey, this is interesting. What? How can we learn more about it?" And that all starts with reporting and facts. So we kind of doubled and tripled down. We we did see, you know, if you if you think of the 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 media landscape as an uh, ideological spectrum and you start in the center and you move to the left I, i've talked about this before start in the center and you move to the left our view is that that is a very densely populated part of the landscape if you start in the center and you move to the right there's a big hole in the center right and at the same time when we were talking to to possible investors and, and sort of coming up with the ideas to launch this thing, we said, if you start in the center and you move to the left and you ask the people running those outlets what they're doing, virtually every one of them will say reporting in the very first sentence of their answer. And if you start in the center and you move to the right and you ask people, what are you doing? Virtually none of the people running those outlets will say reporting in the first sentence of their answer. And we thought that was a big opening for us. It turns out to have been a much bigger opening than we could have possibly imagined in a way that I think is encouraging, not just for the dispatch, but but for the country and for our discourse. But that was the idea. That's that's why we did it. Yeah. Yeah. I have so many questions now. So one that has come up a, a couple of times now, once you started writing critiques of Trump and Trumpism, uh, once you became aware of that, I would imagine within 
you, you developed friendships and you had colleagues uh, in conservative circles that were pushing back. Uh, what kind of pushback did you get? Did you lose friendships? What was that like for you as you started becoming more vocal and public in your uh, in your concerns about Trumpism? Yeah, I mean, you know, initially, I would say virtually everybody in my world shared my concerns about mm-hmm. Trump and Trumpism. And, and a lot of the, those people were making those arguments publicly. But as it became clearer and clearer that Trump was likely to win the Republican nomination in 2016, um, and then certainly when he won the presidency in 2016, you just saw people flip sort of en masse. And a number of these were people that I had had conversations with, you know, public, big name people I'd had conversations with in mid-October of 2016. You know, this one person who's uh, very carefully or, or, or often described as a Trump intellectual talked to me openly about how he couldn't wait for the election to, to be over so he wouldn't have to keep making arguments that he didn't believe to defend Donald Trump. And, wow. you know, it was it was a, there was no sort of guile about it. It was just like this was how it was. He, he had to do it, but Hillary was going to win. Then he could go back and be sort of in the opposition and get back to arguments that that uh, he was comfortable making. And lo and behold, Trump wins. And, and you know, this guy goes on and will defend anything and everything that Donald Trump has ever said or done. And you know, Jonah Goldberg, my co-founder, has has talked about this as well. But I mean, it wasn't uncommon to be on a panel at at Fox where you would do a debate and or a discussion. And at the end of the discussion, if you you know, you we were going we didn't have to go out of our way to criticize things that Donald Trump did. I mean, he did something almost every day that was sort of outrageous yeah. by the standards of of you know human behavior. <laughs> And, you know, so we would make what what I continue to believe are sort of the obvious critiques like, oh, no, you shouldn't call a woman horse face. And, right. you know, you'd, you'd have these other people, including people who wrote books about virtue and, and uh, you know, women who had criticized Trump in the past say, well, you know, in fact, her face really is long and horses faces are oh. long. And, you know, I mean, you just would like. And you just think, what are you talking about? But then the then the cameras, the lights would turn off and they would say, oh, I'm so sick of having to make these arguments. And my response always was, you don't have to make these arguments. And I think it was a real disservice, disservice to Fox's viewers because it created this impression that everybody was on board with Donald Trump, except for a few of us, you know, finger wagging holdouts. When in reality, most people were not on board with that. They just went along because they thought they they had to either for career reasons or what have you. I forget off the top of my head when exactly you and Jonah uh, very publicly tapped out of of Fox News. Was it the Patriot Purge? Was that the? It was. Yeah, it was November of 2021. I was surprised that it took that long, frankly. So what was that the breaking point or were you was it was did you feel like the frog in the uh, the boiling pot? Yeah, I mean. It's a it's a long and complicated answer, and I'll try to I'll try to keep it reasonably short. I mean, you know, being at Fox through 2015, there it was a fun. We had a good time. Um, you know, certainly there were moments of excess. I had done a lot of reporting on Benghazi for the Weekly Standard. I think it was a scandal. I think senior Obama administration officials lied. I think they should have gotten in trouble for it. You know, that said, I would watch some of the coverage at Fox and think, what are these people talking about? Like, I've done all this reporting on the facts, like these conspiracies they're floating are just not true. Like, why is this happening? So, you know, you're aware of that. And and I probably was too quick to shrug off some of those excesses. Although when I talked about it on air, I would sometimes point them out. I would say, no, I don't think that stuff is true. Here's what's true. Um, then, Then, you know, after sort of the arrival of, of Donald Trump, it, became, it just was less fun uh, to be at, at Fox. And I was increasingly concerned, and Joe and I know was too, at the ways in which particularly people on primetime at Fox were, as I just described, defending his indefensible positions, sometimes repeating and rationalizing the lies that he told. He told a lot of lies. 
and sometimes lying on his behalf, even when we knew that they didn't believe it. So, you know, my, my approach to, to working at Fox uh, from the beginning was keep your head down, work as hard as you can, do your best, don't get involved in the politics, don't worry about anything. And I stuck to that for most of my time at Fox. But as, you know, as these incidents were sort of, as the, as the frequency of these incidents increased, it's sort of unavoidable. You'd see something, you know, I wasn't typically watching a lot of Fox shows, but something would cross my Twitter feed that Lou Dobbs said. And you just think, that's just not true. Or something that would, that was part of Tucker's monologue. And you think that's, I can't believe he had this guy who's white nationalist adjacent on his show. And, you know, so I let my views be known inside of Fox with increasing regularity. I was, I was, I think they came to regard me as sort of a pain in the ass. I'm just like, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing this. And we, there was, there was thought about leaving earlier. Um, I, th I can't remember exactly when I re-upped my contract, but it was in at some point in 2020. And I was pretty sure before that I was going to leave. Both Joan and I had lots of conversations um, with senior people at Fox who said, look, this is all going to change. Trump is going to eventually go away. And everybody at the network recognizes that we need to get back to sort of news and reporting and that this isn't, this is not sustainable. And I think the people who made those arguments to us totally believed them. I believe they were completely sincere. I think that's where they thought the the, the network was going, and so, and they were persuasive. So they they kept us on. The the other argument we heard uh, that was not quite as compelling because we just weren't on very often, but we had people, including lots of Trump skeptics, who said you guys shouldn't quit because when you're on, even if it's not very often, you can push back on some of the this stuff. So rather than have, you know, a, a conspiracy be floated and just go unchallenged, typically we would, would challenge it. But that, that wasn't, as I say, that wasn't entirely compelling because we weren't on very often. And even when we were on, mostly we were asked questions uh, or pushed to talk about Joe Biden uh, and, and things that Joe Biden was doing wrong. We weren't, you know, it was very obvious that the Fox viewers did not want to hear us criticizing Donald Trump. And Fox producers knew that, Fox hosts knew that. And so we weren't very often asked to come on and talk about Donald Trump. So we stayed um, and, and you know, tried with our little resistance faction inside to affect what change we could. And I think Patriot Purge was the point for both of us where we said, we're just totally deluding ourselves if we think this is going to change. And it gave us like, I'd say sort of hard evidence that that was the case because we saw the trailer trailer was i don't know three minutes long and it included a number of claims that were demonstrably false and deeply irresponsible the u.s government is bringing its helicopters back from afghanistan to go after half of the country in what is the war on terror too but it's the war on terror on trump voters and i'm paraphrasing there but that's very close to to the actual language None of, none of that was happening. That was just wasn't happening. And, you know, we made it very clear inside of Fox, like, we know this isn't happening. This shouldn't air. Like, we shouldn't be party to this. This is irresponsible. And I think it's going to, you know, it, if I believed what was being said there, I would be a revolutionary. I would be somebody to say, like, we can't let the government do this. And I thought then and continue to believe that that, that is really dangerous, that the likelihood that we're going to see political violence come out of that kind of, of lying is, is real and probably increasing. And, you know, we made those views well known inside of Fox and hoped that they would not air the, the show and they aired the show. And at that point, it wasn't there wasn't a close call. I mean, obviously, we had to go. So do you read the firing of Tucker Carlson and then a couple of days before that uh, of Dan, uh, a host like Dan Bongino as that someone like Paul Ryan's being more persuasive in the boardroom? Or do you think it's purely a bottom line driven calculation? I mean, I think it's probably neither of those exclusively. I, I, I think I don't know much about the the story of Dan Bongino, but I know he'd been sort of agitating internally and pissing people off for a while. So I, I, I don't know that I tie that to, to the Dominion suit. 
I think there's an editorial component to Tucker's dismissal. You know, there was, and I think, and I think Patriot Purge played a role in that. There were senior people at Fox who were surprised by the contents of Patriot Purge, who didn't know it was coming and then saw it and couldn't believe what it was. And I think there was a serious, if um, short discussion about killing it and not having it air, that it was something that Fox didn't want to be involved in, that it was too far. And ultimately the decision was made that they couldn't shut down Tucker and a lot of work had gone into this thing and they didn't want to be on the other side. You know, Tucker, I think if they had tried to kill it, strong likelihood that Tucker would have left. And I think that was sort of a moment for some of the executives at Fox to say like, okay, we've let this guy and other primetime hosts basically run unsupervised now for a while and it's too big. Like we have no control. We've, we've lost the ability to control. And I think that was, you know, it was sort of one of those things that was everybody knew was the reality all along, but that was a moment where it was unavoidable. Like, Oh, okay. We're not in control here anymore. And I do think, and I think, you know, on the flip side of that, it also told Tucker, like you can create something that's huge elements of it are just not true and you're good. Like they're going to let you do it. And so I think I think that that was part of sort of the editorial calculation. You know, I don't have any um, real personal inside information. I mean, I'm still talking to people there uh, pretty regularly, but you know, I think these these lawsuits played a role. I, I I don't really buy the story that it was Tucker's sort of salty text messages that that ended his time there. I mean, I do think it's it would be sort of understandable if, if Fox executives really weren't familiar with what was in Tucker's text messages and deposition and were in fact surprised by that, that they would say, oh, this is problematic to put in front of a jury. But it, if they didn't know, if Fox executives didn't know what was in Tucker's deposition and Tucker's text messages, that means that they weren't briefed by the lawyers. I find that so hard to believe. It would be one of the worst cases of legal malpractice I could possibly imagine. Um, bad lawyering. So I, I have a hard time kind of believing that. I think it's really a combination of a of a bunch of factors. Um, and you know, we we haven't heard we haven't heard Tucker's side. I don't know what he's going to say, but there have been sort of it's it's a uh, uh, Jack Schaefer from Politico had a piece yesterday about how basically everything we know comes from anonymous leaks on both sides, which makes you just have little confidence that you really know what happened. Right, right. I guess some of my questions are the desire to be optimistic about something, the desire to be optimistic that the dispatch at some point will have a much more prominent voice in our culture than Fox News. I'm sure you share that uh, that hope. I mean, I sh I share the hope, and like I said, I mean, and this is not forced optimism. I mean, I'm 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 down about a lot of things in our politics, uh, as, as you can no doubt tell, but we didn't think that we would grow as fast as we've grown. And, you know, we've got almost 40,000 people as paying members of the dispatch and I think approaching 250,000 people who are on our, on our email lists, people who have said, I, I want a different kind of journalism. Yeah. Um, and that's just, that's incredibly, and, and almost all that I should say until really the past two, three months, almost all that was organic growth. Um, mm. So we weren't really doing much in paid marketing side, mostly because I'm clueless about all that. And, and that's really encouraging. I mean, I think people, people who have come and, and spent time with us and, and taken on our, our, our work, give us that feedback all the time. And that is like, you know, the, there are all sorts of surprises when you, when you do a startup and you're almost 50 years old. Um, but I've been so pleasantly surprised at the, the, the impact that we are told that, the work has had on on sort of individuals' lives has been really great. So I want to be mindful of time. I have pages and pages of questions, but I I need to start <laughs> landing this plane. So one thing I, I got to ask you. So as you launched this incredibly successful media company, what advice do you have for uh, guys like me, indie podcast producers? Anything? Uh, any words of wisdom that uh, we could achieve maybe uh, one-tenth of one percent of your audience's uh, uh, reach? 
Well, I would say you're already doing the most important thing was just do it regularly, right? Do it regularly, yeah. have good guests and be engaging and, and you know, your stuff. I, I told you before we started recording, I was listening to your interview with, with Will Salatan. It was one of the best interviews, one of the best discussions I've heard about uh, American politics and political journalism in the past decade. It was just fantastic. And, you know, the more that you're doing that, then people will hear it and the more they'll come. I think part of the the challenge for people who are, you know, they're, they're launching a, a sub stack or an indie podcast is they, you know, over the course of a weekend, as they're brainstorming about what they want to do, they have all of the enthusiasm of a, you know, a recent college grad, and they're ready to take on the world and do it all. And then life intervenes, right? It's, it's not that easy to Obviously, you do a lot of preparation for your podcast. You spend a lot of time going back. I mean, you were you were throwing quotes at at will from articles that he published in like two thousand two. Um, <laughs> you've done the same thing with me. So you obviously spend a lot of time preparing. That, that takes that takes an, an investment, um, and you have to be serious about it. So so just to be doing it on the regular, the way that you're doing it, and then to put out something engaging, like that's the first and most important thing to do. We also, uh, to dispatch, we had advantages. Um, you know, we were, as we, we discussed, we were on Fox regularly. Now, a lot of the Fox audience didn't, didn't like us, uh, as much as they perhaps once did. Um, but Sarah Isker who, who joined us oh, and, yeah. and, um, you yeah, know, is great as you know, is on ABC news. Now I'm at NBC news. So we have sort of reach people are seeing the dispatch name in a way that gives us kind of an unfair advantage over, over other, other independent, um, media outlets. But, I think just doing the work, showing up and doing the work and, and, you know, staying true to your, staying true to your mission. You know, we wrote this thing, we published this thing on the first day we launched internally, we call it the manifesto. And I don't know, it's like a three page thing. And we titled it very creatively. What are we doing? And <laughs> it just laid out what we were doing. And at the time, I think if you, you talk to Jonah about it and our third co-founder, Toby Stock, we just thought it was important to explain kind of what the thing was. Um, people, you know, there've been articles written about that this thing is going to be launched and we just wanted people to know, Hey, this is what we're doing. That was the, it was a very utilitarian purpose in, in drafting and publishing that. But three and a half years in it, it's great import. I think to us is providing public constraints on how we operate. Because we made a promise in the first thing that we published that we were not going to be an out that provided affirmation over information. So if there's ever a temptation to do that, or, you know, somebody can say, look, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars to run this ad. Um, and it's an affirm, you know, it's an affirmation play. We know that we'll be held accountable because we we made this all public. And we have a number of things in that first um, document that turn out to have been important, not just as an explanation of what we were trying to do, but in keeping us sort of focused on our mission as we've gone. Yeah. So speaking of mission, I got to ask you a question about our mission. What do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, or, or nurture relationships even with people across our differences people who think differently than we do, who have different beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do. How, how yeah. can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other? Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the, I love the title. Um, and I love the approach. I mean, you, you know, it's in the intro. This will sound like a horribly cliche answer and, and, and I'm afraid it's true. I mean, I, I believe this, I sort of deeply believe this, do it, like have the conversations. Don't be afraid to have the conversations. I think so many people assume things about people that they imagine to be on the other side that are just not true. There's a fantastic book, actually, it's up on my, my bookshelf called Collective Illusions by an author named Todd Rose. If you haven't had him, you should call him. He would be fantastic for this. He's put together You're the third person who's recommended Todd Rose in a very short amount of time. Yeah. I mean, he's phenomenal. I would say like, you know, you don't often read books that sort of change your, your frame on things. And he did, he's got decades worth of, of research on our uh, misapprehensions about people who, who are ostensibly on the other side of political issues. And we're all closer on these issues than we imagine we are. And we're closer than we we're told we are by the people who are invested in keeping us apart. So whether it's 
Fox News or uh, you know a, a lefty progressive um, outlet that that's the alternative, what have you. They make money. The more people are angry, the more people hate each other, and I think the more people misunderstand each other. So the very most important thing you can do is have the conversations. Talk to people about it. Don't make assumptions about about what people believe. Ask them what they believe and try to learn something. I mean, this is this shouldn't yeah. be sort of revolutionary, but like, don't don't enter these kinds of conversations with the goal of impressing upon them the fact that you already have the answers. Yeah. So often as not, we don't have the answers. I think that's a great point because I think a lot of folks might only know you as the guy who had unparalleled access and wrote the authoritative biography on Darth Vader and just come to all <laughs> kinds of assumptions about you, you know, but uh, hopefully hearing, you know, the human behind the, uh, the writer. <laughs> Undoubt undoubtedly true. So for, for those who don't know, what I'm referring to is um, I was fascinated at what kind of access you were given. Um, I, I do want to wrap up real quick, but you, so um, Steve wrote a book, uh, came out in 2009, Cheney, The Untold Story of America's Most Powerful and Controversial Vice President. I was fascinated by how, like I said, just unparalleled access. How did you how did you manage that? Yeah, I mean, I, I pitched him on cooperating with the book and giving me that access in 2004. And I was very clear that it was going to be a reported book. Um, I said, I want to write a book. I want to research the hell out of it. I want to do a ton of reporting. I'm. This is not going to be a hagiography. This is not going to be a, a book that's designed to, to burnish your vice presidency or your political career. And there'll be stuff in there you don't like. And there was definitely stuff in there that he didn't like. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I came pretty sympathetic to to him politically. I agreed on him far more often than I disagreed. And my pitch was basically like, I'm going to I'm your best bet for a fair shake. You know, if you engage with me, I'm not going to do sort of gotcha journalism. There's not going to be there, there won't be cheap shots strewn throughout this this book. I will talk to you as much as you will talk to me and we'll have a conversation about your life, your politics, your career. And and I'll write it, and and that's what I did, and it was a tremendously rewarding experience just for the access, as you say, and the opportunity to have, you know, that kind of back and forth. We had a lot of of arguments over the course of the of the the reporting of the book and and some of the interviews, um, particularly about how he he interacted with the media. But it was it was a terrific experience. If I had to do it again, I would. I only spent I think three years working on it, writing it, but I, I would want to do it in ten because there's just so much to, to get at, but I, I enjoy oh, it. Yeah. And if there's a, if there is a follow, you, you said at one point in the book uh, that, and the story is still being told or something like, Oh, is there a story still being told his last couple of years? So yeah. I, I'd be interested if there was any follow-up to that book. <laughs> yeah. He, I mean, I, we ended up having to publish it in 2007. Um, oh. They were trying to, my publisher Harper Collins was trying to, to beat out a book that ended up not being published, or they thought they were trying to beat out a book that ended up not being published. So I would have liked to have waited till the end of the Bush administration. And there were things that came out um, in the last year and a half that I didn't, I just, they just don't really appear in my book much um, because mm, they okay. came out after that. But yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a really tremendous experience. I, I enjoyed that. And I, you know, was privy to a lot of stuff. I never thought a kid from Wauwatosa, Wisconsin would, would get to see up close. You must have been pinching yourself at different points, like sitting with the vice for president, sure. you know. Okay, last couple of questions. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah. What was the main inspiration for doing this? Like there's not there's gotta be, and you've probably told this on the podcast uh, before, so I'll ask your listeners to to bear with us, but you don't do something like this unless you've I mean, it's a mission driven podcast. Like you're you're trying to do something, you're trying to prove something. Why are you doing it? I find myself straddling very different worlds and I don't feel comfortable in any of them. Um, mm. So for, I grew up in, a, in an observant Jewish household. We went to an Orthodox synagogue when I became a Christian in my late twenties, as you can imagine, I had to have some very difficult conversations about religion with my father in particular, but others in my family and people I grew up with. Then when I started going to church, I realized that what brought me to those convictions aren't necessarily what primarily defined the community that I was a part of. I Ooh. was I was really moved 
by Rabbi Jesus, the Yeshua ben Yosef, and the theological convictions that I, I had arrived at through the Sermon on the Mount. And what I realized was that community, the church that I was a part of, couldn't be primarily defined by those same convictions, but by political and, and social positions. And especially when those two things were at odds, I, re I, I relied on scripture and there were a priori positions that, that were stuck to. So I had to have very difficult conversations in my I've been kicked out of a few Bible studies uh, mm -hmm. by having the temerity to say, hey, guys, let's read what it says here in, in yeah. this book called the Bible. Um, and I just thought, you know, for years, I thought, man, this really is a primary problem in our culture. Let's have these conversations and let's do it better. Let's yeah. not assume, well, like you were saying before, let's not assume, do this chain, mental chain of like, oh, he he has an Obama sticker. He must be this, this, and this. Or uh, he voted for Romney and Ryan. He must be X, Y, and Z. I just wanted to have these, do it better and reclaim just a little bit of space in the public square. Um, that's the motivating factor for me. Yeah, well, it seem, seems like it's working. Um, and it, you know, it, uh, my, my previous answer about, about what we can all do was, was not meant to be a plug for the, for your podcast, but it is, I mean, like, I, I think it's the most important thing you can do, have these conversations in a respectful, respectful way and see what you can learn. So how can we find you online? How can we find the dispatch and all the great work that you and your team are doing? Yeah, I, the dispatch is just the dispatch .com. That's probably the best place to go. Uh, I I host with Sarah Isker. I don't really host it as much anymore. She does most of it. Uh, a podcast called the Dispatch Podcast. Um, we do an interview podcast once a week and a roundtable discussion at the end of the week that we have a lot of fun with. That's another place. So find us on your 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 podcast channels and subscribe. I guess I can point you to my Twitter account. I don't do much on Twitter. Uh, these days, I'm pretty disgusted with Twitter and social media in general. It's at Stephen F. Hayes uh, is my Twitter account. And uh, terrific. I usually just prom promote dispatch stuff. Yeah. The F for Forrester for Grace Forrester. I read a little bit about her. She was an inspiration, wasn't she? She sure was. She's my, my, yeah. my grandma. She was amazing. Yeah. So before we go, is there anything important I forgot to ask you? No, this was great. Uh, very comprehensive. As I say, it was, it's, it's sort of obvious you've done your homework. So I appreciate oh, the discussion. Thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Sorry again to be a pain uh, getting this set up, but I'm glad, glad we made it happen. And this was a lot of fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks again. Take care. As always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend about TPNR. We're easier to recommend than ever. It's politicsandreligion.us. That's www.politicsandreligion.us. Or you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E and S is in Sam at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. <laughs>